Hello, Nina. Thanks for joining me again. Thank you for having me again, Sergio. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, the pleasure is all mine. And we have another newsroom. Another newsroom. Yes, yeah, so much has happened in so little time. Uh, let's have a look at uh, uh, Spain's Data Protection Authority because they say RIE has just used very basic and the free version of Google Analytics, um, which used anonymized data and um, uh, only and, and only the very, very basic version, which was okay to use. Yes, this is the Royal Academy of Spanish Language. So the RIE, as you say, and the Spanish DPA, the, the um, AEPD, has for the first time seen the glass half full, to put it like this, after Google Analytics was really considered high risk or directly forbidden in Denmark, Italy, France, the Netherlands, Austria. But of course, they were, doing, they were using it in a very basic manner without any ad tech integration or any uh, individual user profiling. So in that way, it's somewhat aligned with the CNILs, the French agency's long-standing guidelines recently updated, but um, guidelines that will allow the use of the tool and decrease the risk of sending data over to the US. In any case, this is a platform that is really extremely popular, widely used. It goes with the new development of new websites. It is understood to be even a best practice in web development circles. So it's really hard to get rid of something like Google Analytics. The big tech are omnipresent. They are everywhere and you cannot avoid Google. Um, you cannot, um, and they, they, they're convenient. They're so big, they're free. But why is that? You don't have to wonder too much because they it is because they have collected all that data, uh, which made them which enable them to learn so fast and and grow so strongly. Well, it is about the size of the original market, right? I think you've got a very consistent market, very uniform with the same business culture, which is massive. It allows you to really test what you're doing and and have real market proof at scale. By the time you leave the US, it being you being, for example, a US company, then you're ready to take on the world and you're ready to expand to throw your learnings at a smaller market. If you are in a small, tiny European country, you produce a very small level of confidence in the product. And it's very hard to expand. By the time you try to expand, you've got someone from the bigger market throwing their learnings at you. In a way, at a smaller scale, it happens in Europe with Germany. So it's sort of like gravity and the planets, I think. And it's like, <laughs> you know, products are a bit like this. And that's why I believe Europe is always going to have a challenge. You know, creating real technology that spreads and that really conquers a market like the US. And we're not even pondering languages. The nightmare when you start spreading across Europe and you realize that you need to speak every language and you need to adapt to every culture, which sometimes is specific to a region, not a country. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I didn't think of that like uh, I didn't think of it like that, but yeah. So do you want to move on? <laughs> sure, yeah. So the ICO, the UK's data protection agency, issued brand new guidelines on international data transfers, providing this tool, a practical tool for businesses to carry out what we call transfer risk assessments, even though this concept is not in the law, but making it clear that either such tool or the guidelines provided by the EDPB will be considered valid. And the tool is very practical, again, so it could be useful for others in other countries. You never know. But um, yeah, the transfer risk assessments make me think about like how in the future will we do with the metaverse? Don't we need like a more global, more universal, um, some basic law regulation and guidelines that um, will allow us in the in the online world that will allow us to have um, uh, uh, the same protection for everyone, no matter where we're from, where we access this from, uh, where our country of origin is, or where we just 
are in this very moment because in the metaverse we're all virtual anyhow so do there need to be new rules for the virtual reality well it reminds me of of the uh, these dreams we had about cyberspace back in the day and it is a beautiful concept escaping jurisdictions and building code into law and so on and there's still plenty going on right with with DAOs in Web3 and so on. But I don't think we can escape national boundaries. If you do anything wrong, even if it is in what we can for now call the metaverse, you'll realize that you take off your goggles and you'll face reality. The police will be there waiting for you. (laughs) Yeah, I would guess. So let's move on. Sure. So the EDPB the European Data Protection Board was pretty active this season. They released various reports. One of them is the the result of the cookie banner task force they had set in order to have a common approach to the NOYB or MaxRem's complaints about cookie banners that did not have a reject all button on the same layer as the accept all on the first layer. So this concluded that the vast majority of the agencies did not accept hiding that reject all in a second layer, that you would need to have accept all and reject all on the same layer when you get a cookie banner, which pretty much leaves Spain as the odd one out because they still accept the the option to configure uh, on the first layer. In any case, they did agree on a few other things like uh, non-conformity of Predict consent checkboxes on a second layer, a reliance on legitimate interest, and all of these options that you get to disable legitimate interest within the consent management platform, which sounds like a total twist of concepts. They also agreed on the non-conformity of the use of dark patterns in lake design, colors, contrast, and so on, and also in rejecting the inaccurate classification of essential cookies. There was another report, also by the ADPB, which was about the use of cloud services, software as a service, by uh, public uh, bodies. And it found that it may be hard to provide supplementary measures when sending data to the US, now that we still do not have a framework or adequacy. So it suggested that switching to to an EU or EEA um, cloud service would solve the problem. So um, plenty of uh, companies are moving to and, and public bodies moving to European data centers, but very often they're owned by a US company as well. And if you're rejecting even that because of the risk that under the Cloud Act, the US government or the National Security Agency demands records about Europeans, then it leaves you with few op- few options, because in the end, the large cloud providers are all US-based, and they provide features, sometimes even privacy-enhancing features, that you will not find in smaller local providers. So it is tricky. In any case, it's a good segue uh, to the latest update on the EU-US data privacy framework, because Also, the EDPB released its non-binding opinion, voicing concerns about proportionality, the data protection review court that was set there by the US, and bulk data collection by, again, national security agencies. So what's next? The EU Commission will now proceed to ask the member states to approve it in the hope of issuing an adequacy decision by the summer, by July this year. And in theory, that would do away with all the headaches that we are seeing, right, Uh, coming out of SREMS 2 um, after Privacy Shield was invalidated. If it were not, because plenty of people are already talking uh, about a SREMS 3, even Max SREMS himself, um, saying that there will be another challenge because this is not considered enough. So we'll see. Yeah, we will see about this, how this is... um how this will continue. Enforcement updates. Yes, enforcement. So 
Let me give you some basic background on the fines that, that we've had. So, first, it's been pretty interesting to see how the data protection agencies uh, in the continent, right, so not Ireland um, and not, not the UK, have been milking the cow, so to speak, of the e-privacy directives loose end when it comes to the GDPR's one-stop shop. So in the end, since we never had the e-privacy regulation, as it was supposed to be released at the same time as the GDPR back in 2018, and the idea was to have both in sync, they're not in sync. So we have an opening for any data protection agency to avoid referring any big tech enforcement cases to the Irish data protection commissioner whenever cookie consent is involved. And I say that because big tech companies, both American or Chinese, tend to be based in Ireland because of tax reasons or other reasons. And so this fact that under e-privacy you do not, of course, have a one-stop shop has been also uh, made clear by the EDPB Cookie Banner Task Task Force report that I was referring to earlier. What's the consequence of this? That France or Francis Kneel has been really going on a spree. So Microsoft was the last major victim of this particular gap and uh, it received a 60 million euro fine. And uh, you may remember that Meta and Google had received already fines for the same reason, which is not having a reject all button again on the same layer when serving cookies. TikTok also received a fine. In this case, it was 5 million euro fine. Same reason. So again, not being as easy to reject cookies as it is to accept them. And not having enough. The CNIL went on to give Apple an 8 million euro fine for collecting unique device identifiers of visitors to its app store without prior consent or notice in order to serve its own ads, which is kind of like a cookie or local storage system when it comes to e-privacy, because you may be wondering, well, these are not cookies. But Article 5.3 of the privacy directive never said cookies. It is about storing identifiers or anything that will not be uh, exempted within the device in order to, again, do marketing in this case. So uh, it is paradoxical in the case of, of Apple, of course, after so much talk of privacy, but they're not doing it anymore in the, in the current um, iOS version. And the CNIL did not stop there. So another very interesting case was Voodoo, that's a leader in hyper-casual mobile games that you see people playing all, all around. It was also a target and it received a 3 million euro fine for lack of proper consent when serving, and praise yourself for this, an IDFV, which is a unique identifier for vendors, which is the one identifier that Apple allows you to keep to, to use when through the app tracking transparency prompt, which tells you, do you allow this app to track you or not? When that's declined, you do not get access to the IDFA, which is the cross app identifier, identifier for advertisers, IDFA, but it does give you access to the IDFV, which is sort of the equivalent of a first party cookie in the, in the app world meaning you can track your unique visitors within your own app. So the CNIL find Voodoo for using the latter, saying, okay, you may be complying with Apple's policies and you're not you know, receiving the IDFA um, because you never got consent through the Apple prompt under Apple's law, but you're not complying with e-privacy because you should have requested consent you should have obtained consent for that separate IDFV. And in the meantime, besides, while all of this happens, something that is very interesting and annoying, and we've mentioned before in some interviews, is that in France, the Conseil d'État, or the Council of State, if that's the correct translation, uh, 
forced the GNIL to allow the cookie war. You know, this idea that what you can see now in Le Monde and French publishers and German publishers, where it says either accept cookies or pay. So you can subscribe or pay, or you need to accept cookies. That idea, and considering that, calling that free and valid consent, it's quite, that is quite controversial. But that's what you've got in France at the same time as you get all of these fines. That's, uh, I'm not sure how this is regulated, but it, as so many are doing it, that seems to be the way forward, which is so silly and so ignorant of people who cannot pay. Of course, you can always watch the news and TV, but sometimes you want a more in-depth analysis. You want to find out more about a topic, and then you cannot because it's all hidden behind a paywall. Totally, yes. And in the context of this, Ireland's DPC, the Data Protection Commissioner, imposed a 390 million euro fine on Meta. This was the big news, I think, this season. Uh, following a lot of pressure from the EDPB for relying on the, on the contractual legal basis in order to serve personalized ads, targeted ads, which itself is the core model of Instagram and Facebook. So 300, 390 million euro fine was the result of adding both fines, one for Instagram, one for uh, Facebook. And we had a debate on the matter with Tim Walters uh, in English and Alonso Hurtado in Spanish here on Masters of Privacy. And I also published a separate piece about it. So. I guess they could just move to France, Instagram and Facebook, and then simply see whether we would be as happy as we are with French publishers if Facebook or Instagram started saying, well, pay for using Instagram or consent. I wonder what we would think then. Yeah, it, you are right. It ridicules consent and it ridicules every individual to the point that, oh, yeah, you want to give consent, fine, do give consent because we're obliged to. But there is no point in doing so because we trick you and uh, anyway, because we're intransparent about what consent you actually give us. Mm, and this is not right. Well, what do you think of Twitter? Speaking of ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> so Elon Musk not happy with having fired key senior executives in charge of EU privacy compliance, including its chief privacy officer and DPO, yeah. suggested that he would oblige its non-paying users to consent to personalized ads. And so the Irish DPC already said, well, please come here for a meeting because we need to draw a few red lines. But my question is the same. Um, you know, what do we say about Le Monde and Süddeutsche Zeitung or Zeit doing exactly the same thing? Yes. It's, uh, I, I haven't looked into the details, but it sounds exactly like this. Like, okay, you're not paying, so, well, you're not paying money, so you have to pay with your data. We'll make you or we'll uh, not, uh, we'll block access to our website or to into our content. Yeah, what is more discriminatory? You're saying that people that cannot afford to pay cannot really form an opinion on the basis of good journalism and there's the accept all cookies. And now we bring this over to social media. So if you can only access Instagram when you pay because no single legal basis works since consent is a joke and there will never be a way for people to understand what they agree to so they will keep on rejecting the unknown. Therefore, the legal basis does not sustain itself according to the basic argument in favor and there wouldn't be enough of a sample to sustain targeted advertising. So we have another problem. Only those who can afford it can access and enjoy social networks. Yes. Well, I will move to something really fresh out of the oven, which is the revenge of legitimate interest, to put it like that, as a legal basis. And I have to explain it well as it has a few moving pieces. So in, in essence, there is a growing momentum in the UK and the EU for the acceptance of the legitimate interest as a legal basis for purely commercial or direct marketing purposes. So while the uh, court, of Just, court of Justice of the European Union decides on a question posed by a Dutch court 
in January, in which the DPA there issued a fine to a tennis association for relying on legitimate interest to share member details with its sponsors who then sent offers to them. A UK court, a first tier tribunal, has ruled against the ICO, against the UK DPA, and in favour of Experian, which is a well-known data broker, for collecting data about five, well, more than 5 million people from publicly available sources, including the electorate register. And they did that to build customer profiles and subsequently sell them over to advertisers. Experian has relied on legitimate interest and said it found it too burdensome to properly inform every single person. This being the ICO's main point of uh, contention. So the decision does appear to indicate that using legitimate interest would not be possible if the original data collection had been based on consent. But even this is not entirely clear. So just to make it even more mm -hmm. clear and simple, even though it seems to have a separate life uh, of its own, the UK government presented a new draft on the upcoming UK Data Protection Bill, and this was done on March the 8th. And it includes a pre-built shortcut uh, to using legitimate interest without need for the so-called three-part test. So purpose, necessity, and balancing test. Now, data controllers can go ahead with this new, with this legal basis, if they find their purpose in a non-exhaustive list provided. Okay, some housekeeping now quickly. We'll be hosting a couple of low-key live events if you happen to be around. One is here in London on March 23rd, and another, that's a Thursday, and another one in New York on the 30th. We're counting on a few past guests of the show and hoping to get a live recording on tape as well as enjoying a few drinks. You can find out more and register for either one on the meetup.com links provided in our social feeds. And uh, straight away, I'll move to the US and get started with Epic Games. So Epic Games uh, and the US regulator agreed, um, I think it's the FTC, agreed to a $520 million fine for directly targeting children under the age of 13 with the Fortnite, with its Fortnite game, right? And the default setting allows them to engage in voice and text communications with strangers, and this made it worse. But also, they used dark patterns in their in-game purchases. That's one. Now, separately, um, on the private lawsuits front, which is very important in the US, uh, Meta agreed to pay $725 million after a, a class action was brought in California against Facebook, so again, part of Meta, on the back of the ever-present, still, Cambridge Analytica scandal. And also the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, BIPA, keeps putting money into the pockets of claimants and class action lawyers. In this case, uh, this season it forced Whole Foods, which is the upscale organic food supermarket chain that is owned by Amazon, and it forced them to settle for $300,000. We've previously commented on cases against TikTok, Facebook, or Snapchat. Um, but this time it was the monitoring via voice prints of its own employees that triggered the particular lawsuit. A lot of stuff. Let me first uh, comment on Epic Games. For that, I want to say $520 million is quite a lot of money, but I think um, objectifying children and making them the target um, or, uh, and the basis of your business model cannot be um, held against any money in the world. Like, what are you doing? What are you playing at? This is such a successful game and people love it. Children love it. And 
and and and they are their main customers and then targeting them exploiting them is intransparent and disrespectful i've got nothing more to add to that and i think they should treat their customers a lot better um uh from meta uh, 725 million pounds uh dollars sorry um meta has lawsuits all over the place when do they begin to learn that this is the way they can go yes and we may start seeing class actions in europe very soon under the collective redress directive so facebook could be bracing itself for that too or meta now also in the us in what i believe is the first case of its kind even if you look at the eu with perhaps the fashion id case at the ecj coming close better help which provides online mental health services also catering to some specific communities anyway so better help has received a 7.8 million dollar fine from the ftc for using lookalikes so facebook lookalike audiences and similar offerings from snapchat pinterest i believe Creteo has also received this data and of course they use it to find potential customers on the basis of their similarity or the similarity of that audience with their own customers again it is sensitive data it follows repetitive disclaimers by better help that data would in no case be shared so the ftc has gone hard after them so nina there was another big piece of news which is going to take us into the competition and digital markets section but anyway it's really important google was sued by the department of justice in the u.s for anti-competitive behavior in its dominance of the ad tech stack across the open market or the ads that are shown across the web and beyond its own beyond its own properties so in theory it used or so goes the argument it used the dominance its dominance on the publisher side the supply side for that inventory with their ad server being you know well, called gam and formerly called uh, dfp or double click for publishers really controlling that market i believe they own 90 percent of that market and they would use that to then further dominate the other side so demand side advertisers and many of these advertisers are already glued already dependent on google ads or dv360 as a platform to invest in search keywords or youtube inventory and it got to the point where because they were bidding on their own ad exchange which acts as a middle as a piece in the middle to then decide who wins a bid against that inventory and they would manipulate this and i won't get into the specifics which are also very interesting of of second price bidding but what they did is that they ended up favoring publishers and paying more than was due at the expense of advertisers so they weren't really keeping money for themselves in certain cases but instead giving extra money to the publishers therefore sort of reinforcing the flywheel as publishers found themselves with even less incentives to work with competing ad servers and then the flywheel keeps on spinning anyway it is complex exactly that that uh, it's it's a very complex topic it's it's uh uh, difficult to grasp the whole um idea behind what is happening um but that alone tells me that what Google does and and the market power that they have and that they exercise um, to put, I don't want to say an end to that, but to, to put this into a proper, more consentful and more um, protective for the individual, more protective form, um, will that ever be the case? And on the side of um, of um, advertisers or, 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 or um, online shops who, who want to place ads. Will they ever be able to do this in a consentful way? Will they ever to be able to use Google 
when you cannot really avoid Google because they are everywhere. So I think what the Department of Justice did is a very bold step. And I do not, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I have no idea of, and I cannot make any predictions of what the outcome that would be ridiculous. But um, no matter the outcome, they make an point. And this is that it, maybe this, hopefully this will open a door for, I don't want to say for lawsuits to follow for Google, but to um, uh, to open a, a legal debate about what goes and what doesn't, especially in the advertising world. And, and that it is, extends away from Google and told advertising agencies, digital agencies, to think about this, bringing this more into the public, uh, making this more of an issue and and talking about this and and finding solutions. And then other people will find solutions. Comp there will be competition that will offer um, different um, ways of, maybe some will just work around, will just circumvent the problem. Others will go knee deep and offer more sustainable approaches. Uh, but I think opening the debate up will diversify and and open up the um, the way and uh, and and will hopefully result in lesser power for one large corporation. It is a good point. Um, maybe this will move the needle. I think for starters, we may realize that the open market doesn't really do that much. It seems like we don't really discover new stuff on, on newspapers through the open market, the open programmatic space, and that it is remarketing that works. And I mean, technically, it works in terms of the technology, even though what you see is the things that you have already bought, as it's normally the case. But the technology works. But do you really discover new things that are relevant on a newspaper. But of course, if that is the case, because discovery does work in Instagram, for example, and those lookalikes that we've criticized and that, you know, we're in the, in the middle of that find to better help, they work. They may not be worth the investment for retailers, which is also a good yeah. point, because they share too much of the revenue with Facebook, with Meta. But the system works. So then if we realize that that's the case, then I guess it will simply push more people as we clean the programmatic, the open environment, and we force Google to, to let us see what really works and doesn't, and the fiction disappears. Maybe we end up with more people going to YouTube and Google search, besides, of course, Meta. And then there is more control to the aggregators and not less. Hmm. In any case, <laughs> a few other things that we have not mentioned, and um, and they will be in the in the text version of of this update. So one quick update on the Artificial Intelligence Act. Everyone is talking about this within the EU. We've covered that in a couple of Masters of Privacy interviews here in this in this podcast. The Council. Adopted the Council of the EU adopted its final position on it. We'll keep on following it. Then, at the same time, new common rules on cybersecurity became a reality in the EU with the approval of the NS2 Directive or version 2 of the Network and Information Security Directive. This happened at the end of last year. The new framework covers the usual stuff incident response, supply chain security encryption but the difference is that with v1 is that it leaves less wiggle room for member states to get creative if that's a way of putting it when it comes to essential sectors such as energy banking health or digital infrastructure and in the u.s new rules entered into force on january 1st so in california we had the the CPRA, which updated the CCPA, 
and in Virginia the CDPA. Both provide a set of rights in terms of ensuring control over personal data being collected across the internet, like opt-outs, access, deletion, correction, portability. But California creates a private right of action that could pave the way for a new avalanche. Let's see. And, um, and Virginia's doesn't. In any case, only companies that meet a minimum threshold in terms of revenue or the amount of consumers affected by these data collection practices, and they vary those thresholds across the two states, only those companies will have to comply with the new rules. And one last piece of news is that uh, privacy by design, which we have mentioned many times, uh, the, these, these seven principles originally laid out by Anne Kavukian in as Ontario's uh, Data Protection Commissioner back in the day, well, privacy by design will become an ISO standard with the number 31, well, 31,700. And this happened in February. So we finally have an auditable process to conform to these principles. And I believe now they've become something like 30 criteria. We'll see. In any case, Nina, this was long. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was um, super entertaining. I loved it. Uh, another a uh, very uh, inspirational um, uh, episode, I think. Uh, I hope people will like it too. Yes, so do I. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>